Got everything managed. Are you ready to go, Travis? Yep, just need the ball. Yep. Um, so next up is Travis Palmer, pastor cracking beyond 15 characters and under $500 without burning down your house, I assume. Without burning down your house or hopefully anybody else's. Right. Yeah, it generates a lot of heat, man. All right. Should be able to present. Excellent. All right. Whenever you're ready. All right. So, yeah, this is Cracking Beyond 15 Characters Under $500. Other titles for this talk were Greener Pastures Over the Computational Wall or Why XKCD Advice is Easy to Understand and Hard to Do. That second one is something that my management suggested. And, well, we'll get to the reason behind that in a second. So I'm Travis. Uh, I'm also a nerd, so I go by the pseudonym Travco. I'm an OSCP, OSCE, and GMOB, if those letters mean something to you. And as is tradition for speakers, a couple of my favorite hobbies outside of security are along the right side, ARMA3, D&D, &D, and BWC. Uh, yes, again, I am a nerd. And uh, my beard is nowhere as magnificent as the last two speakers of this track, so I'm going to kill the video now so that you folks can get full screen slides. And also, uh, well, we've got a lot of content to cook through but as fast as I basically can. So for this talk, uh, we're gonna start with a fair bit of background before we get into the meat of things. Uh, I should give a disclaimer. I have limited time, so I can't make this an all-inclusive introductory talk. If you've never heard of Hashcat before and are thinking, where can I adopt one? Uh, this talk is gonna be a little rough to follow. Just stick around, you'll learn something and you'll definitely have some keywords to Google later. So let's address, uh, well, what should always be the first question? Why? For me, it freezes up terribly. There I am. We're going to have to click it. We're going to have to click it. Uh, well, large corporations still are using character minimums that were determined in 1985 by the Department of Defense to be resistant to offline brute force attacks over a 1,200 baud modem. And even then, they should have been rotated every couple of months. They also have complexity requirements that should seem familiar because they've become pervasive and are largely responsible for a lot of people honestly believing that taking almost any English word and adding a number and an exclamation point in the end makes it an acceptable password. Spoiler, these policies in isolation have not magically become more secure since 1985 and are still guarding very sensitive things. Thankfully, most of these websites and companies have some additional safety nets, like detecting questionable login origins or 2FA. Well, except for Wikipedia, which, well, doesn't. Uh, and historically, might have actually had one of the worst password policies on the internet. Thank you, Troy Hunt, for using a megaphone to broadcast the history here, which I just, why? Your fix were zero character passwords was a one character requirement? Uh, there's also a large number of places where that eight character standard, well, isn't. Uh, which frankly is a little baffling given some of the sensitivity here. PCI is the payment card industry, which this only covers the systems where the payment card info is stored. And that seems a little lackluster. Uh, the other side of this, imagine the kind of information somebody could collect getting into your Facebook or Pornhub account. Imagine what they could do to your reputation by controlling it. We just had a talk about this on the same track. And then there's eBay, and I shouldn't need to explain the level of financial ruin an auction site can bring up if somebody else is visiting for you. Uh, Wells Fargo, a deserving punching bag perhaps, but they just haven't wisened up. That's a 14 character limit. And is there seriously a database with plain text credentials limited to 14 characters in the back end? And there's Netflix. Uh, does it really make sense why Netflix accounts get hijacked all the time? I, I understand the want to make four, pin, four number pins usable, but Really? Finally, we have a whole suite of devices in tech, and I'll pick on Cisco because I love them so much that historically, by default, I have no password, and the policy might get set by the person installing it. But, you know, eight characters suggested. This seems deeply questionable, especially as a recommendation when, again, those passwords were determined to be only resistant to attack on networks in 1985. While I'm on the trend of bashing trustworthy sources, I should also talk about NIST, uh, the National Institute of Science and Technology, and what they say, given that what they say often seeps into government regulation. Special Publication 
63B released in 2017 said the requirements should be eight plus characters with no complexity because someone did the statistical analysis and found out that people actually produce easier to brute force passwords under complexity requirements, like adding a number and an exclamation point. They also say the maximum length should be at least 64 characters. Mm, a hint of where things might be going. There's also this key section here that says increased password length is a key security control and to encourage passphrases. You hear that? The future is coming slowly and the late 80s might finally end soon. The most recent guidance on February of this year, mind you, not the first time it was published from NIST and the FBI, it was a lot more explicit on this. Uh, 15 characters without other complexity requirements is where we should be going in fact, we should require it as soon as possible. And this is in line with what a bunch of other experts and sources that aren't the largest tech companies have been saying for much, much longer. In fact, a security consulting group that I greatly respect, Black Hills Information Security, makes the suggestion to their clients and uses a more paranoid standard of 20 characters internally. Neat. Though you might be asking, okay, why is Black Hills specifically on here? Well, it's because I'm picking on them. And we're about to listen to some snippets of audio from a webcast last December. I'm not sure if audio easy, will come through. No, easy. If you go to the next slide, my son's computer, he's got a gaming computer. It takes eight minutes to crack an LM hash. If you take the same 14 character password, it would take 4.3 billion years. This is kind of what I'm talking about with, with regards to um, the password policy that they set in 1985. I mean, in 1985, an eight-character password policy was secure forever. Because, or, you know, yes, 90, days. Years, 90 days, okay. So it was secure for long enough for them to um, be, we don't need to do anything. But... I mean, as technology changes, so do the password policies need to. Hey, this is a this is warfare, right? Everything is move, counter move. We have electronic countermeasures. You have electronic counter countermeasures. And then it goes up above that, and I lose track. So, hey, so we're getting questions about uh, have you run the Google comment word attack against passphrases? So, like, if you just load words into a cracker, that doesn't that crack? Passphrases. Sure. Yes, it does. How many combinations of four word passwords are there? So, how long is that going to take you? What if you start using words from a foreign dictionary? What if you start putting salt into those words? Like, but I just, I think that four, four words, and if you start using special characters as a spacer between your words and things like this, I, the question is are you more secure than you were with eight? But yes, there are attacks against everything. So, so Darren kind of summarized this up. This from the field kind of our results, but I just did want to talk about it. We have no success with people who have 15 character passwords approaches zero. And we have tried these things. Now we're constrained in our time. Normally we don't have more than a week or so to do our password guessing. Whereas attacker, according to a Verizon report, they've got like what, nine months, something like that. Okay, another question, Jason. Yes, so uh, this question's come up a few times. Are spaces legal? Yes, they they are a spe special character and they are very good. And it depends on the... the... And I'm just going to cut it right there. So there's a couple of things here and they do give good recommendations. It's solid reasoning behind this. It's impossible to save an LM hash when you have more than 15 character passwords. So if those really old Windows domains, yeah, this is really where you need to be going, just to be absolutely certain. And they have a couple of other pointed recommendations, but perhaps the most interesting thing mentioned is that they have been given hashes from a domain with that 15 character passphrase policy specifically to crack them. And the amount they can crack in one week approaches zero, basically no success. Well, pack it in, presentation over. Uh, that's all folks. No? You're not buying that? Well, good, because neither am I, and I should address the final reason I'm here presenting on this topic in particular, which unfortunately does mean we have to have another quick soundbite. But so getting on to password policy, so you know, taking that innovative kind of incubator mindset and looking at passwords. So passwords are 
something that's highly audited because it's it's very easy to do. If you're an auditor and you're trying to assess whether somebody's passing muster, you can have this rule set and you can walk in either if they pass or they fail. And you'll see a lot of that, and, and a lot of the companies have this password policy that comes straight out of audits. Eight characters and three or four of uppercase, lowercase. Special characters and numbers, there, I just rattle it off. It's been almost 20 years of that. Um, so um, you know, we looked at that, though, and as we went through the red teaming, we found that one step in what we call the kill chain, if a attacker were successful, and, and we actually give them a leg up, we actually bring hackers on and, um, and, and bring them in as fake employees. We give them a laptop and a password, and they start. And we found one step in the kill chain was taking all the passwords and cracking them. And they would run computers with, with graphic processing unit uh, augmentation, and they'd run for hours, uh, and they'd be able to, to crack a few passwords, and hopefully they'd find a privileged account, uh, and then they were off to the races with that. So while that was only one step in what I call the kill chain, um, we just said, you know, we, we want to win that battle. And here we are compliant, but it's just not getting it done, you know, just meeting, meeting compliance. So we ran some some math on the whiteboard, and we said, well, what if we went out to a really long password, 15 characters, but got rid of all the complexity requirements? And, you know, I have a lot of um, a, a lot of people with high math SAT scores in my team. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, and so we had some great whiteboard battles, and, you know, how much better would it be, and that sort of thing. Um, but it, it, what kept creeping in there because of kind of that tick box mentality was, well, we have to have complexity. Everybody's expecting that. We have to have uppercase and lowercase and on and on. But we said, well, let's just try it out. Um, so the math held, and we felt pretty good about it. And then around that time, the, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, released an updated standard. And they said, well, length is king. And if you can get a longer password, you can get rid of some of that stuff as long as you look for commonly used passwords and, and block them out. So long story short, we did it. And it took about 90 days to roll it in. Uh, and the impact has been substantial. Um, and, and the only reason we were able to do that is because we innovated and created this, this thing that we called the Kraken, that every single day tries to crack all the passwords in the company. And we see the success rate of that machine just dropping precipitously. We saw it. Now I'm going to cut him there. But uh, yeah, that information's public now. So let's quickly recap it. Uh, 15 characters, no complexity. Yes, we crack our own domains. If you remember my job title, yes, the above. And transitioning to that 15 characters uh, standard was definitely a good idea, but uh, well, given the existence of this presentation, you might guess that it wasn't a silver bullet, and it wasn't. So we need to start talking about that math that Jerry mentioned. Now, the math might hold up, but the equation isn't necessarily realistic. There is more than one way of approaching this problem, and I've heard the argument spun multiple different ways. The first of which is it's inconceivable to crack a 15 character password because brute forcing through all the possible numbers and lowercase letters is 1.6 sextillion combinations, which is, yes, huge, massive. You're not going to crack that on modern hardware unless you're the NSA. Another argument I've heard that comes from a better standpoint is assuming the passphrase is made up of words, and there are a lot of words around five characters or more. So you can say that a 15 character passphrase is probably three words, which is extremely difficult, and you'd have to go through more than 50 quadrillion options to be sure. Okay, big number, but certainly smaller than the last one. And the last argument I've heard, and perhaps the most educated of these strawman arguments, is based on the common requirement of eight characters. Doubling that gets you just about 15 character requirement, and so maybe we could think about pass races as just multiple passwords combined, in which case the lowest margin for cracking is just trying all the combinations of two relatively common passwords, or common passwords, which if you're using the Rocky Dictionary, well, that's still over 205 trillion, which they'll say is unreasonable. Well, I'm here to tell you that all of these arguments that say cracking past 15 characters, regardless of reasoning, can be undermined. And they can be undermined by only three factors. What are those factors you might ask? Are you just teasing us? Is this a timeshare scheme in disguise? No, the big secret weakness is humans. Inconceivable, I know. Specifically, humans are bad at big numbers. Human pack, humans pack complexity on the ends, the ends of passwords or passphrases. And humans pack similar, humans pick similar things. Similar things to other humans. Common things are common because they're commonly picked. Before I get too far, we should define some limits to what is reasonable, and I should address the other part of the clickbaity title for this talk, why the $500 limit? Well, 
besides it being a nice round number that's easy to pitch, it's also the roundabout cost of an entertainment system, and you can safely assume that every type of threat actor you might need to be worried about, including LulzSec and your script kitties, has access to this amount of money. It's also an amount that can pack a pretty sizable punch regardless of the path you take, either owning a cracking rig or renting out cloud computing. $500 is more than enough to go off and build a small cracking system out of a used GPU from eBay and some outdated desktop, which should net you around 53 giga, giga hashes a second against NTLM. Or you can go the route of the cloud, and in AWS, $500 gets you 68 hours on a spot instance, which yes, might get preempted, probably won't though, with eight V100 GPUs which you can do manually, or you can use a management tool like Coalfire's MPK to manage the spot instances for you and both scale and automate the attack. If you are an attacker and what you're planning on doing is a series of short running attacks, instead of waiting 68 hours for all the results, why not automate spitting up 68 instances and just get the result in one? Sadly, NPK doesn't work too well with Google Cloud, which appears to be cheaper, and you can actually squeeze out 83 hours of time on an instance with eight V100 GPUs which besides being terrifically cheap, brings us to a terrifying theoretical max of 189.3 peta hashes of NTLM we can get. Not mega, not giga, not tera, peta, 189 quadrillion. If we compare that to that last straw man argument of the rock you dictionary on top of itself, sure, theoretical isn't real performance, but the difference isn't off by a factor of a thousand times, although humans are bad with big numbers. Which brings us around to the second straw man argument, and I'd like to throw in an alternate equation, mostly jokingly, that is still very conservative for how many guesses it takes to crack a three-word passphrase. All of the passwords that aren't obsolete to the third power divided by the number of people in the organization or the number of hashes an attacker has to crack, all of which is divided by the factor of human laziness squared. How do you quantify human laziness? Don't ask me, but trust me, the value of that variable always seems to be greater than one. Uh, the very conservative hypothesis here is that people making a passphrase are going to use words from languages they know and can think of during the duress of password creation. I did say this was going to be very conservative, which tends to be a lot more limited set. In fact, I'm going to say right now and support later that pool to pick from for people seems to be somewhere between 32,000 and 64,000 words, which bring me, brings me to a point where we need to break out a lot of math. Because underminer number one, people are bad at big numbers. Uh, thankfully, people are good at spotting trends after they have all the information. And I've done a lot of math for you up front here. So let me give you something that's hopefully a lot easier to parse. This is a chart of the actual computational limits of combining words together in attack for a single 2080 Ti on NTLM hashes, which I pick only because it's a consumer GPU and I have access to one. The horizontal axis of this chart is the number of words in a passphrase. The vertical axis is the size of the dictionary, or perhaps a more useful way to think about it, the rarest word in a password that can be cracked, because a logical attacker is going to use a list of words by frequency. Uh, the bigger the list is, the rarer the words are going to be in it. And as for everything else, the numbers in the boxes are the amount of minutes to complete an attack in that search space of the passphrase. And the coloration tells you how long that time is relative to minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, or years, because I'm not going to lie, I don't know off the top of my head how many minutes are in a week. Now, going down or to the right exponentially increases the amount of work needed, and there are some jumps in difficulty that are sharp, and this is where the idea of a computational wall comes in, a seemingly sudden increase in difficulty that you just can't go over. But of course, this is only the chart for a consumer GPU. What about a V100? Well, it's actually not that much different. There are reasons why a V100 should be much better, but it isn't a variable for this chart anyway. What if we have more than one GPU? What if we have eight, just like those cloud instances? Well, the chart's going to shift down a little bit and open up some options. Uh, those of you that notice the size of the numbers we're dealing with on the vertical axis already probably have some nightmares to take home, but I'm going to make sure everyone else has them too. In the two-word column, that is more than 16 million words in 20 minutes. Basically, every word actually in use from every language spoken by at least 1% of the world's population fits in here with room to spare for a couple extra million common passwords. And the three-word column, that is every non-obsolete word in the English language that is testable in a matter of hours. And the four-word column, we have a sizable chunk of commonly used words where a targeted attack, say, scraping from memos or websites or targeting individual people makes sense. Now, before I get too excited, uh, someone I'm sure has been thinking, okay, cool, but that's NTLM. What about a slower, actually, quote unquote, secure hash? 
Well, here's the same chart for SHA-512 Unix. And you'll notice there's still some viable attacks on two and three word passphrases. And here's bcrypt or blowfish configured with Unix defaults. Although we do lose a lot of capability, we can still go after two word passphrases. As an attacker, this chart does make me sad, but the reality of most corporations using Windows is that there will be somewhere something using a hash like NTLM for quite a while to come. And as far as the individual user is concerned, uh, they need to have a passphrase that isn't going to get cracked when the hashes get dumped, either inside their institution or when a website that they use gets all of its passwords dumped by SQL injection. And let's be real, a lot of major websites and companies keep on getting caught with their pants down, and we only find out they're using a fast hash the hard way. Not to mention the difficulty of computing a hash is a linear factor in a world where computing power is increasing exponentially. So I'm going back to the other chart. Because it's time to get into the attacker mindset and play a game of bad recommendations. The first up is Google, and yes, the advice is old, but the advice, much like their policy, hasn't been updated in more than a decade. I Love Sandwiches isn't a great example, and that mix of lead speak and case shifting doesn't actually do much for the difficulty. I'll be generous and say that it makes about 100 times harder. In terms of the rarity, the slide shows where various, walls, various words fall on Google's own most search words and the most frequently occurring words in the English Wikipedia. That's the G number and the W number. Uh, the fact of the matter here is that the underlying phrase is crackable in under three minutes, and so even giving them the benefit of the doubt on the difficulty of guessing lead speak substitutions, it's crackable in 244 minutes. And I should also mention the recommendation put forth in the absolute latest NIST and FBI recommendation, because they suggested a passphrase voices protected 2020 we are, but then suggested that a passphrase that's even better is director month learn truck because the words are unrelated. Well, those words might seem unrelated, but they all have one thing in common, and that's that they're all eye searingly common. The rarest word here is truck, and who oh boy, that's in the top 4,000 words regardless of the list you choose. Or common words are not safe from offline cracking, which does bring up another perhaps more viral recommendation, XKCD 936. Now, a lot of people have used this as password advice, including management intercontinental exchange, and the matter of it is, the math in XKCD's advice, as written, is fine, because it was written to handle an online attack where the rate of guessing is only 1,000 a second. Now, there is a claim here that the average user shouldn't I have to worry about attacks and cracks on a stolen hash, but I'm here to tell you from experience, the average user doesn't attend a security conference and reuses passwords. The average user also works at a company, and if that company is larger than a couple dozen people, they should worry about stolen or dumped hashes, both from their infrastructure and their websites that the users are using both professionally and personally. Four common passwords, yeah, isn't safe from offline attacks. If anything, the XKCD example is actually a little stronger than intended because staple isn't actually that common of a word. It's number 11,367 on the Wikipedia frequency list and just completely off the end of the Google list. And the level of entropy XKCD says is a common word. Well, if we say common words are words that are in the first 2048 and the attackers, well, they're gonna win all the way out to six word phrases. Yes, really six. Now, there are some caveats, and the real world isn't as simple as the Excel sheet. So before we get into real world results and the mechanics of attacks, we should very quickly cover the things that are going to be ever present when attacking these passwords using a GPU. The first of which is the dictionaries, and specifically the size of the dictionaries. There is a lot of bandwidth to go around for operations within a GPU and its memory, but transferring data to the GPU, while PCIe Gen 3 by 16 is only 16 gigabytes a second max, theoretical, not real world, and that might seem like a lot, but that is against 16 billion theoretical bytes, that's 16 billion theoretical bytes per second, and modern GPU can do 26 billion real hashes of passphrase per second, and one of these numbers doesn't fit within the other and also is real, not theoretical. The other limitation to be mindful in terms of what it, kind of attacks are possible is the nature of CUDA, Compute Unified Device Architecture. I'm not going to talk about the AMD equivalent for sake of time. Cores on the GPU and what they can do, which is, well, not a lot. They were built to do lots of single instruction, multiple data computations on matrices and vectors of graphics, which means lots and lots of units that can do arithmetic, ALUs, and not a lot of space or silicon devoted to controlling them. The nature of single instruction mobile data means groups, or in this diagram, rows of ALUs all need to be doing the same thing at the same time, 
and those instructions in a significant portion of the data need to fit into a smaller shared cache and oh right the instructions better be simple and something can actually do because if it's something that's not actually implemented and it's not going to work and this is where we have to say a quick thank you to the hashcat and john the ripper devs because oftentimes the best bet in those programs is the best way to actually do it on a gpu anyway and you're better off just finding a workaround so thank you to those devs let's talk techniques and results uh, first, dictionary attacks, basically checking through a massive list of passwords in a file with or without GPU, generating some additional similar candidates to crack through rules. We'll do more on that later. Intercontinental Exchange, we've been running a dictionary attack during the period Jerry mentioned in that soundbite, and we rolled out the 15 character policy. And as you can see, this graph of the average length of a correct password, well, the policy wasn't just successful, it caused some rapid jumps in lengths when it actually started to get enforced. And after implementation, the average length uh, evened out despite some outlying spikes. This is, of course, the less interesting half of the story. This is the graph of the percentage of passwords that were cracked in dictionary attacks. Yes, that number in the upper left is 50%. Dictionary attacks are very good when you have a dictionary of passwords made under the same password policy targeted. And yes, uh, dictionaries also aren't very good after people change their password out under significantly different and better policy and start picking things that just aren't going to be in the dictionary anymore. In fact, if we overlay the two graphs, we see multiple downward shifts in the number of cracked passwords, even after the average cracked passwords is above 15. The average length of those cracked passwords is above 15 characters. As further enforcement for changing cracked passwords was rolled out until it settled somewhere around the 1% range. Mind you, didn't approach zero, it held down near a certain percentage, there's always somebody picking and repicking a terrible password. These graphs are trim, so it doesn't show anything that's happened particularly recently, but I assure you, straight dictionary attacks have not had much success, but they've also definitely not gone to zero. Sorry, Black Hills. So let's talk combinator attacks, attacks centered around combining multiple dictionaries or the same dictionary onto itself. The attack's pretty straightforward. We've already kind of talked about it in those computational limit slides, so let's get right into the results. And well, here is a chart of every passphrase password longer than 15 characters ever cracked in Intercontinental Exchange that was crackable with a small dictionary of words or common passwords and organized to reflect the charts from that computational wall part of the presentation earlier. And in order to do this, I had to modify an algorithm for dissecting passwords called ZXCVBN. I highly recommend it, but it does have one particular issue in that it doesn't handle common separators like spaces between passwords in a passphrase. And Apparently the creators just didn't think that was important and still haven't added it. Anyway, I digress. Uh, a password, a passphrase is slotted here when you fix the algorithm based on how many elements, usually words, but sometimes a common password, CXCVBN believes it's made up of. And the, rare, the rarity of the rarest element is based on the number of guesses required, which should roughly dictate the size of the source dictionary required. We can see there's a rather precipitous drop off somewhere between 32,000 and 64,000 along with a pretty significant preference for three element passphrases, which <clears throat> might've had something to do with certain recommendation package with a policy. <clears throat> uh, now this is neat and all, but what about other data sets, say not from this company? Well, I considered calling up various companies with a 15 character policy and seeing if they're willing to give me their password hashes, but it seemed unlikely. So I kind of had to artificially make one. Here's the results from over 37 million hashes from the Have I Been Pwned version two collection where every password known to be less than 15 characters long has been stripped out. And this is really only possible because 90% of this list has already been cracked. Both of the attacks here are pretty shallow and short running in large, car in large part because I only need to prove a point. And also the hash rate here is going to be artificially terrible. And this is gonna be a recurring theme because when you cross check 37 million hashes for a match, it slows you down a little bit. Most domains do not contain 37 million people. That being said, this is 1.14% of all the passphrases in the data set in one attack in less than three minutes. Are you scared yet? Good. Because this is an example of what happens when you use a lot more candidates and you actually start checking for combinations of passwords inside a passphrase. If you still remember that third straw man argument, well, this is the entire Rocky data set on top of itself. And yeah, you can do it. And it takes one day and 16 hours in this very weird case on one GPU where we're cross-checking through seven million hashes. Normally this only takes 16 minutes on a single machine in AWS or Google Cloud to do this. And it costs single digit dollars. Now that I've got the would-be crackers excited, there are some technical shortfalls with Hashcat that need to be quickly noted. Uh, the combination mode only takes two files input. So you're gonna, if you wanna use this with Hashcat and you do wanna use this with Hashcat, 
uh, you're going to have to make some intermediary dictionaries to go after those three and four element passphrases. Being mindful of exponential file size, uh, it's also a similar deal for hybrid mode, which only takes one word list and one mask file. You could use other programs and pipe in candidates, but you pay the piper when doing so on a fast hash. You can only transfer so many things for PCIe. The other thing Hashcat isn't going to do for you is generate variants of a passphrase candidate with spaces and capitalization that people are actually going to be generally using, which, while from what I've seen, you're going to want to use title case sentence and lowercase both within and without spaces. Easiest way to do this is with individual rules on a combinator attack, starting with a pre-processed dictionary that already has the spaces between capitalized words, and then you can just manipulate it easily enough with J and K rules to get the spaces and capitalization desired. Which, on the topic of, is another shortfall. Uh, you can only use one set of rules for word list in combination mode. Yes, sorry, if you want to check lots of different things using rules, like common words in between two words, you're going to need a honking massive bash file or another program to manage it for you. And this is actually what Trusted Sex Hate Crack is doing behind the scenes when they, for what they call middle or thorough combinator attacks. All right, enough about the conditions of combinators. We're not gonna go back there. Uh, let's move on to Prince Attacks, which despite the other name for the attack has actually nothing to do with the artist formerly known as Prince, is a acronym for probability infinite chained elements, but its purpose is simple, take the path of least resistance and find more passphrases sooner by outputting shorter link candidates first. Not only is the search space a little bit smaller, but we can also expect to find more passphrases here because people tend to pick passphrases close to the minimum required effort. This overlap of least resistance motivation is just great for an attacker. How does Prince work? Well, it ingests a word list, it sorts all the contents by length and puts them into separate lists, and then begins producing candidates at the minimum list specified length out of the lists of various lengths, iterating through all of the possible combinations of lists until all the options are exhausted, at which point it moves on to making longer candidates. Now, after the explanation of how prints works, you might be wondering, okay, why not just use combinators of length cut lists? Aren't prints and hash get separate programs? When I have to pay the piper, wasn't that terrible for performance? Didn't you just say that a couple of minutes ago? Well, yes, you do have to pay the piper and you could manually manage all these attacks with a combinator, uh, but it gets pretty crazy to manage all the lists and combinations for three and four word elements. It's doable, but you really need another programmer script or some solution that circumvents this and comes right on back to one of the undermining factors. This is the positions of dictionary elements in passphrases here at the bottom. And larger numbers mean more passphrases contained an element straight out of a dictionary in that position. And this is again, data from intercount null exchange. And there's um, one heck of a disparity between the last position in the passphrase and the rest of the passphrase in terms of how likely it is to contain a dictionary word. And that's because humans pack complexity on the ends, mostly on the end, but sometimes on the beginning. So the fix for Prince's terrible hash rate on fast hashes when it's piped in, it's rules. Because when you use the default hash cat, well, you can feed in an entire file that contains however many rules you want and you're pretty in the clear here. Uh, but there's kind of a one problem. It's most of the rule sets out in the internet that are actually big enough to make use of all the GPU's horsepower. Well, they're not focused on these prefixes and suffixes that are tacked on on the ends. For that one, uh, you're gonna need something else, which I actually have you covered. Uh, I made a particular word list that is thrown up in a GitHub repo that will be mentioned a little bit later uh, that contains 4,175 rules and soon to come I'll also be releasing a prefix and suffix list based on the frequency data of the crack passwords in the have been pwned version two list. And this really just focuses on prefix and suffixes. 2020, your exclamation point, your exclamation point number, you get it. So let's talk at success rates for prints. Now the kicker here is we'll be making use of that rule list I mentioned. So there's not going to be any single element passphrases but we see a repeat of an earlier trend, namely a sudden drop off between 32,000 to 64,000 and some clustering around three elements, including that suffix or prefix. So yeah, it's, it's almost like everybody's doing the same thing. Well, they kind of are. And uh, well, this works really well for sussing out passphrases, but what about a larger data set? Uh, well, we can also see the reason why people like using Prince attacks. Uh, both of these attacks are the Rocky password dictionary at the source, and both 
I stopped at the same time at one eighth the runtime of the Rock U on top of itself Combinator. And that entire that complete attack I had mentioned earlier in the Combinator section, that took one day and 16 hours. And I'll, it got 5.82%. Well, these are getting almost half of that in one eighth the time. They managed to concentrate a significant portion of that success very early in the cracking. The other comparison to note here is, while these are kind of the same attack with one exception, and that Prince was basically unrestricted for one of these attacks. It, there's, for some reason, it might just be this data set, might be others, but there's a significant van advantage to focusing on only three element passphrases. And that's because we're also using that rule set mentioned earlier, trying to pick the prefixes and suffixes, but it does still show up here and it's notable. Again, the hash rate here is pretty abysmal. So these timings, th these attacks go much, much quicker when you actually have an instance or more GPUs to work with and not checking 37 million hashes. And speaking of fast, it's about time I get to the new and shiny word level Markov chains for going after passphrases that are at their core phrases. Uh, what are word level Markov chains? Well, the simplest explanation I can give is that it's an over glorified state model to store relationships between groups of words. And for this example, we'll do a two, two gram model, think two elements in the state. And if the phrase we used for the training is the cows eat grass, a two gram model will record state transitions for the cows to eat and cows eat to grass. Obviously this isn't terribly useful model by itself, but imagine if it had some more training data, say some hundreds, thousands, or millions of sentences. The intent here is to build up a model of the relationships between groups of words. And if we want to be more accurate, we can also increase the number of elements in the state and raise the number gram of the model to three. Now there is one pre-existing proof of the of concept for this that I could find that actually would generate output fast enough to be useful in password cracking. Uh, sadly, however, it was single threaded, written in a mix of C sharp and C++ and designed for a Windows compile target, which uh, simply wouldn't do for my purposes on Linux. So I created something in similar in Python that's parallel, uses existing libraries and is a little bit more multi-platform in the nature of Python. How well does it do? Well, the astute members of the audience, when I showed this table on the right of every passphrase crack that was combinator findable, might have noticed some members that are um, a little too far to the lower right based on the computational complexity charts we went through before. Let me color that chart for you. Now, the very astute of you might also infer that I did not, in fact, have limit, unlimited access to eight B100s. And also this chart is strangely positioned in the slide, almost as if it extends further to the right. Well, it does. I had a single 2080 Ti for my research and I was also heavily time boxed. So everything here that isn't a shade of green, not from a combinator attack. Admittedly, not a deluge of results, but come on, years, little years with a combinator attack would not have yielded some of these. And a couple out in the six and seven element column. Do you have any idea how long 10 to the 13 minutes is? It's millennia. Clearly I'm very happy, but what about the much larger data set? Well, it's a similar story. These attacks are very quick, even on a stunted artificial case here. And only doing a couple of words, but admittedly, they don't pull in too much. Only tens of thousands, you know, whatever. Uh, the other fact here likely at play here is there just isn't that many passphrases that are also phrases that exist in this data set in the three and four word area. And while I'm here, I'd also like to point out there's an accuracy trade-off. I did that thing again where I did almost the same attack twice. Well, the difference is for the two forward attacks, one of these attacks is two gram, and the other one's three gram. Size of the model, the accuracy of the model. And well, there's an accuracy trade-off here. Uh, it's uh, pretty intense, actually. The three gram got a little over half as much, but took only one twelfth the time. Now, before people get too uninterested here, I really should show the much more impressive slide, which is what happens when you put this to use on even longer phrases. And while there really shouldn't be much out here in this search space, but people seem really content to just use phrases at this length, uh, probably because they're, these should be safe according to most everyone's advice. And uh, these aren't even really common phrases. They're actually just kind of normal phrases. Uh, here's some examples of what isn't safe anymore. That entire left side is actual passwords. And these probably aren't passphrases or passwords you were expecting to leave here knowing are crackable and certainly not crackable in one, two or nine hours at speeds barely over one giga hash a second. Do you have nightmares yet? Because everything here was generated by a Markov model and a simple ha hashcat rule set. And we didn't do any targeting, no dumb passwords as input, no cherry picking shenanigans. And the train data is completely agnostic. 
Uh, admittedly, it does produce some strange candidates sometimes, and I've collected some of the weirder ones I've seen on the right here. Uh, I don't know how we went from intrauterine pressure catheters to kiwi or kiwis. I can only assume one of the websites scraped for the training data was a blog post about making kiwi or kiwis with an embedded catheter cowboy advertisement. I really don't know. Now I should head off some common questions I'm anticipating. Some of you familiar with Hashcut might be thinking, uh, doesn't Hashcut already have Markov chains? Why can't they do this? Well, yes, it does. It has a pre-made model for character level predictions. When you start trying to stretch that out to 15 character passwords and what you want is basically multiple actual word world, eh, multiple actual words, that model falls apart really quickly. Not to mention it doesn't store relationships between words and it will basically never finish because the search space is at least 333 sextillion combinations depending on the particular mask you're using. And if you're thinking, uh, haven't you tried GPT-2 or some other machine learning algorithm? My answer is, have you considered hash rates? Markov chains are actually a really good fit for this because they are quick, especially compared to massive models like GPT-2, which by itself is more than five gigabytes and tends to take multiple seconds to pop out a single prediction. We need millions of predictions per second for it to be remotely viable and password cracking. The other side of this is the more advanced models are focused on making paragraphs and complete pages, barely need sentences. There are very few passphrases I've seen that resemble more than a sentence fragment. All right, head back out of the weeds here. Time to wrap up and summarize, because if you're not an attacker, you've probably been sitting through this talk mildly terrified, waiting for some kind of recommendation. Allow me to wait, allow me for, to let you wait slightly longer by addressing the red teamers first. Red teamers, please don't cop out. 15 character passwords or passphrases are hard, but they aren't that hard to crack. Even against Bcrypt, you should at least be doing combinators, prints attacks, and Markov chains for the duration of your engagement. Don't pretend that your results should approach zero, it should never be zero, and there will always be somebody who picks Hello Spring 2020 as their passphrase. Blue team, your turn finally. Uh, do the math that applies to your situation, and do a little more than just gather some people that scored highly in an SAT a decade or more ago in a conference room and whiteboard it. If intercepted or dump hashes or personal password reuse is a concern for you, and it almost always should be, feel free to use my math and represent it. Unless your organization is cracking its own passwords, you won't know what people are using. Recommend the best behaviors, but plan for the worst, which brings me to something that can maybe serve as a starting point for what to pass along to end users. And uh, this is my personal recommendation and a starting point. So you better bet it's fairly paranoid, but the intent here is to make sure a hash can't be cracked in $500 of expense, regardless of the type of hash, which means making it a logical and likely phrase of five or more relatively uncommon words that are thematically unrelated. We're talking about diabetic unicorn trap Chicago tunnel as a passphrase. And unless you force the attacker to use a large dictionary combining multiple different types of words, cities, structures, fantasy creatures, verbs, medical conditions, and use some words that are uncommon, you're gonna be building your security posture with some cracks already built in the foundation, especially if you're working with fast hashes. All right, any questions? All right, let's see here. Uh, none in the GoToWebinar. Um, I, I did see a couple people mention that their brains might have exploded from the, the math on a few of those slides there. Yeah, I, so I will apologize. I, I have a bad habit of trying to pack a ton in, but it is recorded. So yeah, if you didn't have your copy no. this morning, yeah. That's wonderful stuff. Uh, how difficult is it to get started cracking uh, on these for the red team? That's one question I see. Well, so, I mean, I can put it this way. All of the data that was collected here was with attacks using only one GPU. So admittedly, I was targeting pretty fast hashes, but I have a personal machine that's been cooking away at the right of me, and I have a machine for my corporate environment that remains inside the corporate environment that we do cracking on to crack our own domain. And that one, again, uh, doesn't have very much in it. So you definitely can get going with just a consumer GPU. And as far as uh, good places to start, uh, <laughs> yes, we got one. I knew we I knew There's we always going to be at least one. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as far as getting started, uh, I will say the Hashcat man page is a little hilariously daunting, and it actually doesn't have all of Hashcat's line arguments in it, so you actually have to go to hashcat.org if you want all of the information on it. Uh, and I would strongly recommend seeking out, because there have been a lot of videos in the past by other people who 
speak a lot slower than I do and are much better at explaining things than I do. Yeah. Um, yeah, hopefully that, that GPU gets to do some fun stuff, not just cracking passwords, gets to do some Half-Life Alex, something like that. Yep. Uh, let's see. I know I saw at least one other one in here. Is there any password cracking that uses machine learning to come up with better algorithms than these? Straight yeah. up learning what people generally do. Yeah, so there are a couple of things that people have put forward, though they tend to still at their like base and core work off of Markov chains. And that has a lot to do with when you're doing this like convoluted neural network or you're doing this back learning neural network, whatever neural network you're using for a machine learning algorithm, once it gets to the point of machine learning, you're spending a lot of computing power just making candidates when you could have been spending that computing power trying candidates. So for the Markov chain attacks that I've been doing, uh, I am okay with a bunch of Afghanistan and the Honda Accord candidates coming out of this. Even though that's almost guaranteed not going to be somebody's password, it took me less than one nanosecond to come up with, and it can immediately be just tossed in the pile with the rest of the candidates, and one of the candidates will be much better off. And yes, you can get the slides. Uh, the slides are up on Sketch D, or however you want to pronounce it. Schedule. We yep. can just call Schedule. it this. The schedule website, SCED. Yeah. I, I call it SCED. Um, let's see. So one question, GTX 1080 Ti or 280 Ti? I uh, guess that's asking, like, but given the cost yeah. difference, you know, I'm sure 1080 Ti's are much cheaper than so, 280 Ti's. Yeah, I, I cannot remember off the top of my head what those benchmarks are for a 1080 Ti, but I'm going to guess almost immediately based on what I've seen the eBay prices for and personally taken advantage of the eBay prices for. Uh, your 1080 Ti's are probably a lot easier to get a hold of and you can get them for around three to 400 bucks easy. Uh, there's a lot of crypto people still offloading them. Uh, and you can clean them, right? Like, like, yeah, yeah, you can absolutely well. slot these in. Even if you don't need a NVIDIA SLI to work for Hashcat to eat all of your GPU clean cube. So nice. that's definitely an option. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think that person was just saying that they saw both on the slides and they weren't clear which one it was that you were using. Both. Yeah, that's both. Uh, the, between corporate machines or personal machines is the, the answer for that one. Okay. Sadly, I do not have a 2080 Ti at home. Okay, gotcha. All right, uh, I think that's it for the uh, for the questions. Um, you probably want to go check out the uh, Track One channel in the uh, in the Discord. See if there's any that I I missed in there, and there, there's a lot of good uh, chat in there about uh, about your talk. Very good stuff. All right. Thank you, Travis. Thank you.